Okay. Every day, we are exposed to bacteria, viruses, fungi, and many more pathogens that might make us sick. Every day, we're, almost every day, we're, we're exposed to those, but we still don't get sick. And how is that? There is two types of defense mechanism or defense system that prevent us from getting sick. The first one is called the innate defense system and the second one is called the adaptive defense system. Both of them will make up the immune system. Okay? So if you want to talk about the innate immune system in more details, you will have to know that it is non specific and it is immediate it does not take time okay how is that because the innate system consists of what's mentioned in the book four things which is the skin and you have this so this it's immediate the skin will prevent bacteria from going inside or the mucous membranes the mucous membrane covers the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, or the respiratory tract, which will also prevent those from getting inside our body. Also, it can uh, consist of proteins produced by cells and the inflammatory response. So, what's mentioned in the book is those four things. We have the skin, we have the mucous membranes, we have the proteins, we have the inflammatory response. Those four are non-specific, they act against all of the pathogens but when I say pathogens I mean bacteria viruses fungi things that might make us sick all of those four are non specific they're not specific to one type of bacteria they're not they're not specific they can they will act against all of those kind of pathogens and they are immediate they will not take time all of those will act to stop those from going inside our body and causing diseases so this will decrease the load on the adaptive system if those pathogens get through the innate defense system, they will have to get through the adaptive system to make us sick. Okay, for the adaptive system, we will talk about it in more details later, but you have to know that it is a spe it's specific for a particular pathogen or foreign mo molecule. And it needs time to start working. It has first to be exposed to the pathogen, then it will work on it. So, uh, when we say respiratory system, we think about the lungs. When we say gastrointestinal system, we think about the stomach, the intestines, and those stuff. But when we say, when we say immune system, we're not thinking about a specific organ. We think of the immune system as a functional system. Although there are some organs that have a role in the immune system, such as the lymph nodes or the blood vessels. But when we say immune system, we think that is a functional system, not specified in one organ or not focused in one organ. Okay, so let's talk more in details about the innate body defenses, then we can go to the adaptive one. The innate or the non-specific body defenses consist of first line and second line. The first line is known as the surface membrane barriers. The second line is internal defenders, which consist of castles and chemicals. First, let's focus about the first line, because once a pathogen will encounter us, first it has to go through the barriers. And what the, are the barriers consist of? Skins and mucous membranes. If you don't remember what are mucous membranes, mucous membranes are the lining of body cavities that are open to the exterior. Such as, such as the digestive tract and the respiratory tract, reproductive tract, and urinary tract. The lining of those cavities are called mucous membranes. So the skin and mucous membranes will act as a barrier to prevent the pathogens from entering our body. Also, what is unique about those two things is that they will also have secretions that will support them to prevent those pathogens from entering our bodies. Now, one of those secretions are mentioned here in your book, 
For example, uh, the acidic pH of the secretion will help in preventing the bacteria from causing diseases, as well as the mucosa of the stomach, I should have wrote here the stomach, will secrete HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. It also secretes protein, uh, protein digestive enzyme, which will cause on preventing the bacteria from causing problems. The saliva contains lysozyme, and the submucus is sticky, especially in the respiratory tract, so it can entrap bacteria. Some mucosa are modified. For example, in the nasal cavity, they will have hair follicles or hair, which will entrap the bacteria and or entrap foreign particles, so they can't go inside our respiratory tract. Also, some mucosa might have cilia, which will sweep the foreign particles or the bacteria superiorly toward the mouth to prevent it from entering further into the respiratory tract. So, if a pathogen can go through the barriers and through all the secretions, it will go through the first line defense. So, let's write here the uh, pathogen, pathogen, which might be uh, a disease causing bacteria or virus or fungi, it has passed through all of this and those couldn't stop it. Then it will have to pass through the second line of defense. Okay, let's talk in more detail about the second line. The second line, also known as the internal defenders, which consist of cells and chemicals, have the natural killer cells, inflammatory response, phagocytes, antimicrobial proteins, and fever. We'll start off with the natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are a unique group of lymphocytes. And please don't confuse them with the ones that are in the adaptive defense. You'll find this unique group of lymphocytes in the blood and the lymph. You have to know that they are not phagos, they don't attack the cells through phagocytosis. We'll talk about this in a bit. They, usually they recognize the cells that they have to kill through certain sugars that we, they will find in the cell surface, or that they, they lack self surface molecules. So usually those cells are going to be either cancer cells or virus infected cells. You have to know this. So the natural killer cells will attack virus cell, virus infected cells or, uh, or cancer cells or tumor cells. And they will kill the cell through lysis they will release perforin and this will cause the cell membrane and the nucleus to disintegrate and they will also release chemical and uh, powerful chemical inflammatory substances but what what in my opinion what's most important thing to know about natural killer cells that it does not cause it does not kill through phagocytosis it causes lysis it, it attacks cancer cells and virus infected cells and they are a special group of lymphocytes. Okay, now let's talk more about uh, the inflammatory response. What causes inflammation? It could be due to trauma, which will cause tissue injury, could be due to irritant chemicals, could be due to heat, could be due to bacteria or viruses. Okay, so how, how would we know that there is inflammation going on? What would indicate us that there is inflammation? We call this the cardinal sign. The cardinal signs consist of four things. Some authorities consider five things, but I will talk about the four things. It includes redness, heat, swelling, and pain. To make you understand this, I will explain to you how those, those four things happen. Whenever, whenever we have inflammation, the injured tissue will release chemicals, including histamine and kinin which will cause the blood vessels to dilate. When we have blood vessel dilation, we will have increased blood flow, which explains the heat and the redness. It will also increase the capillary permeability, which will cause leaking of the plasma, which is known as edema, also will, which is also known as the, the swelling. It will also activate pain receptors, which, which explains the pain. Uh, also, there will be attraction of uh, phagocytes, and the attraction of phagocytes or cells through chemical gradient, we call this chemotaxis. You have to know those stuff. Alright, so you have to know that from the inflammatory process, we do, uh, the, the inflammation occurs because it wants to prevent the spread of damaging agents to nearby tissue. 
It also wants to dispose of cell debris and packages. It also needs to set the stage for repair. You have to know those three important points. Okay, so, so first you have to know during inflammation, first of all, you have uh, a gradient of infl inflammatory chemicals. This will cause the neutrophils to leave the bone marrow into the blood vessels, and it will follow this gradient of inflammatory chemicals. So this is, let's say that this is a neutrophil following the gradient of inflammatory chemicals. The point where the gradient of inflammatory chemicals is strongest, it will squeeze out through the capillary. We call this diapedesis, the, squeeze, the squeezing out of a neutrophil from the blood vessel into the tissue. So it went to the tissue, it will continue following the gradient of inflammatory chemicals to the site where it's strongest, to the precise size, uh, site where there is an injury. We call this positive chemotaxis. So this is diabetes, diabetes, this is chemotaxis. And first of all, we have a neutrophil going to the site where there is inflammation. After that, this usually happens within one hour. After that, we have also monocytes going to the site of inflammation, but monocytes, they are not very good at, at phagocytosis. So they will be changed into macrophage within 12 hours. They will take uh, the role of phagocytosis after neutrophils because neutrophils are short-lived. So you have to know first you have neutrophils, but they are short-lived. So then, so you will have after that mono, monocytes, which will change into macrophage, and they will take on the course of inflammation after that. And as it's mentioned in your book, short-lived neutrophils can be uh, on the battlefield. Macrophages are the central actors in the final disposal of cell debris as the inflammation subsides. This is very important. You have to know this: that macrophages are the central actors in the final disposal of cells, the cell debris as inflammation subsides. Okay, so other than phagocytos phagocytosis, what you've just talked about, you have to know that, that there are other protective mechanisms during inflammation. There might be leaking of clotting protein at the site of inflammation from the blood, which will help in walling of the site that was inflamed with the fibrin to prevent the spread of pathogens or damaging agents to surrounding tissue. Uh, also, fibrin will cause walling off or uh, scaffolding of the inflamed area, which will help in uh, healing. You have to know local heat will increase the metabolic rate of the tissue cells, which will speed up their defensive actions. So local heat and clotting factors and fibrin. If the pathogens inside the inflamed area has been there before, then the adapt adaptive system might come and help in destroying this pathogen. Okay, for phagocyte, it could be either a macrophage or a neutrophil. It will kill or engulf the pathogen through cytoplasmic extension. There will be cytoplasmic extension, it will bind to the pathogen, it will engulf the pathogen and bring it inside through a vesicle or a phagosome. The phagosome will bind with the lysosome like this, and it will form something called a phagolysosome. Then the lysosome have digestive enzymes which will digest the pathogen, and then after that the pathogen is dead and it will release it through exocytosis. Okay, so now we're left with antimicrobial proteins and fever. There are different types of antimicrobial proteins. Some of them attack pathogens directly, and other attack pathogens indirectly. The most important ones are complement proteins and interferons. There are at least 20 different plasma proteins, which are complement proteins. They circulate in the plasma in an inactive form. Once they attach to a foreign cell, which could be bacteria, could be fungi, could be mismatched red blood cell, then they will be activated. The process in which the complement protein attaches to certain sugar or proteins found on, the cell, on a foreign cell, this is called complement fixation. You have to know complement fixation, it is important. As a result of the complement fixation, there, uh, the complement proteins might cause lesions or complete holes in the membrane of the foreign cell. This will cause water to leak in, which will cause the cell to burst. This is called membrane attack complexes, MAC. This is important. Uh, complement proteins also can amplify the inflammatory process, can cause vasodilation, 
Some of them can act as chemotactic or chemotaxis chemicals, which will attract neutrophils. Some of them will cause the foreign cell to be sticky, which will, which will make it easier for, uh, to be phagocytized. This is called apsonization. So it's important to, to know that in complement protein, there is membrane attack complexes in which that there are holes or uh, lesions in the membrane of the foreign cell. There can be opsonization in which the foreign cell be sticky or more easy to be phagocytized, can cause vasodilation, and it can act as chemotaxis chemicals, which will attract neutrophils. You have to know those about the complement proteins. Okay, now let's talk about the interferon. Uh, viruses can't make their own ATP, and they need ATP. So they do that by entering in healthy cells and infecting them, and they survive through that. The cells that are infected will release something called interferon. The interferon will go to the nearby cells and it will bind to their, bind to their membrane receptors. And uh, it will cause the, or stimulate the cells to synthesize proteins that will interfere the ability of viruses to uh, multiply within, within those healthy cells. So that's for the interferon. Okay. Body temperature is usually regulated by the hypothalamus. High body or abnormally high body temperature is known as fever. Pyrogens or chemicals secreted by the white blood cells, macrophages, can cause this fever. Okay, so we know fever could be dangerous. High fever can be dangerous. But how does fever protect us as well? Uh, bacteria needs a large amount of iron and zinc to multiply. So during fever, the liver and spleen will gather up these nutrients, so it would be harder for the bacteria to multiply. As well as fever increase the metabolic rate in tissues and cells, and it will speed up their repair process. We've also talked about this when we were talking about inflammation.